Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Oh, boy, it's near the end of February, isn't it? Well, getting closer towards the end. Yeah, pretty close. 21st. Wow, how'd that happen all of a sudden? So a different backdrop tonight. I'm down in Toronto for a few weeks with uh, family. And um, so we have a nice sparkly backdrop. Oh my goodness, so sparkly. <laughs> and uh, so I had the mm, opportunity today to um, go for a longer walk and was able to make it to the, the ROM, the Royal Ontario Museum. Uh, and I was very excited to be in Toronto at this time for this particular exhibit. I was like, yes. I'm stoked <laughs> because some of you may know or not know, as well as being a Dharma teacher, and uh, I'm also a end of life doula, and so the topic of aging, sickness, and death um, are ones I'm comfortable with and curious about and interested in, and um, and I support people through that process as well and so at the rom right now they i think it goes till april but uh not 100 percent. i'll put the link down below and i'll share it here in the chat um after the recording uh it, it it's called life's greatest mystery is i think the title of the exhibit um about death and um, I will let you know as a side note because I didn't know you have to you have to pay the ROM entry fee, and then you have to pay a little extra to get into that exhibit. Marcia, I was a little miffed that they don't tell you that, but when they have special exhibits, they do an extra charge for it. So just letting you know in case you're going to expect that. Hmm. So uh, the. It'll take me a little while to process and integrate all that was in that exhibit. As with any any good teaching, it doesn't provide answers, but just lots of food for thought and lots of uh, uh, explorations. And so it's mostly an exhibit sharing traditions from around the world and around death and grief and mourning and uh, beliefs around meaning of life and and what happens or what is believed to happen after death. Um, yeah, there was lots of beautiful stuff. And so that's partly what's uh, in my forefront of my awareness tonight. Um, and primarily, though, I've really been resonating with um, beautiful teaching that is offered by, um, her, her name is, <laughs> bless you, Sulika, Sulika Juwad. There, I did it. <laughs> Sulika Juwad, um, who is a an author and a columnist. She had for, I think, many years, a column in the New York Times that won all kinds of awards called Life Interrupted, and then wrote a New York Times bestseller um, of a, a book called Between Two Kingdoms about her experience and, and this journey. She goes on to connect with other people in this period of time. So, I'll give the context as well if you're not familiar with with her. She also has a TED Talk and, um, oh, and there was also a movie made about herself and her husband, who is John Batiste. And he is an American singer, composer, songwriter, um, uh, 
record-breaking 11 Grammy nominations um, and also the band leader, not now, of, of Stephen Colbert's, what's it called? The Late Show. The Late Show with Stephen Colbert and he's an he's, uh, important part of that show. So the movie is called American Symphony and it's about um, one particular part of their lives together and what she's going through while he's going through these amazing successes. So, uh, Sulika, no, Sulika, Sulika, long I, Sulika, got it. Um, in 2011, she was 22 years old. She was diagnosed with a very rare form of acute myeloid leukemia at age 22. And I mean, there's so much to say, just in that, just saying that as a statement, it's huge. She goes in, through bone marrow transplants and, and many years of very painful treatments that are, were not working and etc. Eventually, and I forget how long it took, but she did, um, eventually go into remission. And then 10 years later, the cancer returned even more aggressively. That was in 2021. And had a second bone marrow transplant. And all of that, the second arising of it was the time when she and John got married, when he was getting these 11 Grammy nominations, and then somebody was making a documentary about what they were going through. So the huge stuff happening. So this is all background and context to um, a long podcast interview, um, the called the Rich Roll pod podcast, uh, where it's it's a it's long and there's lots shared in it. But there's this one particular quote that I think is so profound. It's got a, a great deal in it. So I'd like to share that with you and see what wisdom is there for us all. So Sulaika, who's, you know, at this point, um, gone through this second round of treatments, etc. She says, you know, when you're trying to live every day as if it's your last, and you're thinking about how you can seize the day, and it, it puts you in this space of urgency. So she, living like this for many years of this really, really precarious health and close to death so, so many times. And, you know, you hear that wisdom, right? To live every day as if it was your last. And, uh, and so she's talking about how that put this sense of urgency on top of everything that was already being experienced. She goes on to say, and I've since come to believe that as well as intentioned as that advice may be, it's terrible advice. <laughs> because if we're all, if we were all to live every day as if it were our last, we'd be robbing banks and eating ungodly amounts of ice cream. <laughs> yeah, so my family member here and I've been talking lots about, well, what would we do? You know, what would we want to eat if it was our last day? And what would we want to be doing with that time? So it's a good question to ponder. So uh, Salika goes on to say, and so she says, this is terrible advice. And so instead, as I navigate this new level of uncertainty, I've shifted to a place of trying to live every day as if it's my first. <sighs> wow. That, that's so good. 
And rather than seeking out these huge, important life moments, seeking out moments of play and tiny little joys. And then she finishes by saying, I feel like I'm moving through this uncertainty in a way that doesn't put me in panic, but places me in a state of wonder. It's so good. So the, the, the thought of living every day as if it's your last, you know, that scrambling to like, I'm not getting and, and like, what, what do I want? And it, that sense of urgency and that she describes also as a place of panic and shifting this to this place of as if every day is my first and seeking out these moments of play and tiny little joys that shift into a state of wonder is uh, so sweet and accessible and profound. As I was walking around today, I was, you know, exploring that thought, that contemplation, as if this was, uh, just going to let this person in, um, you know, as if this was my first day, of course, not as a newborn baby, but like dropping into this heart, body, mind right now, as it is right now. And right now I'm just hearing these sirens, pretty constant soundscape here. And when I drop into it, you know, from a place of like, I know what that is. And it is so different than when just there, I just had that moment of as if it's my first time hearing that sound. It's just, it's kind of a beautiful sound. It's beautiful ringing bells almost. And as I walking around Toronto and seeing people and connecting with people and seeing the art and et cetera, there were so many little joys and moments of wonder. And what she talks about, you know, she's she's talking here about her direct personal experience of this new level of uncertainty in this second round of this rare leukemia that she's uh, living with. Um, you know, she's talking about all of the, the immense in, uh, uncertainty there, but it, it, it strikes me as not being, it's different then. Uh, and also, we're, I think we're all living in a profound state of uncertainty. And some so much more than others, but we're also interconnected and so aware of what's of how it is in the world. That it it is affecting all of us. We know what's happening with our our earth and our environment and each other. And uh, it does give us that we are living in that uncertainty for sure. And that little turn from living each day as if it's our last, that kind of feeling of urgency and it brings it brings a feeling of grasping for me anyways i don't know how it lands in your body uh it does that for me like oh, what do i want to do with what do i you know that feeling is so different than as if it's my first you know and my uh, family member here and i every morning we have tea first thing and the first sip of tea is always so wonderful. We've had tea for many, many years, <laughs> every day, pretty much. And but starting each day with ah, first sip of tea, so lovely and warm and sweet, and yeah, there's so many things that we can uh, 
look at and experience with this little little turn of heart, little turn of awareness that can awaken joy and wonder. Breath by breath. Mm -hmm. So uh, without interruption, uh, as I was interrupting in, in my commentary here, I'll just read um, Su Sulaika's uh, offering straight through here. So she says, you know, when you're trying to live every day as if it's your last, you're thinking about how you can seize the day and it puts you in this space of urgency. And I've come to believe that as well-intentioned as that advice might be, it's terrible advice. Because if we were all to live every day as if it were our last, we'd be robbing banks and eating ungodly amounts of ice cream. And so instead, as I navigate this new level of uncertainty, I've shifted to a place of trying to live every day as if it's my first. And rather than seeking out these huge, important life moments, seeking out moments of play and tiny little joys. I feel like I'm moving through this uncertainty in a way that doesn't put me in panic but places me in a state of wonder. Hmm. Yeah. And for me as a end of life doula reflecting on and talking about death and dying and impermanence and um, all of these truths, same as, uh, yeah, uh, it, it wakes me up to these joys, to the preciousness and impermanence and a state of wonder when, when we really see how uh, rare and precious this life is. All right, so let's uh, practice some meditation, which helps us to wake up to the truth of present moment wonderment and impermanence. Um, and maybe we'll practice. <laughs> It's hard to do when you have a lot of practice, uh, but uh, we'll see what it's like to practice as if it's our first time meditating. And, and that can be very helpful when your practice is getting a little stale. <laughs> okay, so adjust your posture and your space, your lighting, you might like to turn away from the computer or lay down if you need rest, remove any distractions if that's helpful, any supports you need. I'm just gonna bring in a cushion here. <clears throat> So even as you're setting up your posture for your practice, as if you're dropping into this body in this moment without a lot of preconceptions and ideas about who you are and how your body is, but as if it's your first, as if it's your first day your first time sitting or reclining, whatever posture you're in. Mm. And just feeling if your body needs any movements or deeper breaths, any adjustments, any touch.
And then as if we feel so amazed to be alive and awake and in this body, in this moment, a, a sense of wonderment and contentment to just come into rest with ourselves. So that might mean resting your eyes or your hands or both. You could rest your eyes on something peaceful or closed or looking downward. Rest your shoulders and your jaw. Perhaps if this was our first day, our first meditation, we wouldn't have already picked up lots of tension. So see what it would be like to really relax the body, soften the inner belly, Re releasing this sense of any sense of panic or urgency that may be under the surface or unconsciously held in our muscles. And as some of that tension begins to let go, we might feel more weightedness, groundedness, presence, embodiment. Feel the contact of the body with the support that you're on, where the hands and the feet, the buttocks are resting. And then feel the sensations that come that the body's receiving from the ground in this moment. These sensations of texture and touch, pressure, gravity, and feel them with some sense of wonder. To whatever degree that's available for you right now even if it's just a little bit. And as we're Resting here, awakening with these sensations of the body. We can also open to the wonderment of sounds. as if you've never heard these sounds before.
And before the mind gets involved, the body and the ears and all of these sense doors don't have preference. Just experiencing these sensations and these sounds coming and going. And then at some point, awareness touches amongst all these bodily sensations, the sensation that we know as breathing. And notice where you feel that sensation most easily, maybe some movement in the belly, or in the chest, or the sensation of the air at the nostrils. Each breath is never experienced again. It has its birth and its life and its ending. Each breath is unique and we can meet it with wonder and even knowing it as a tiny little joy. Experiencing each breath as if it's your first. At times, we may notice the mind has slipped away into stories of future or past. And when that's met with awareness, we have the opportunity to begin again. As if it's my first breath, first day.
So we can rest with the body and the breath, not out of will or obligation, but with wonder. And as we all move through this uncertainty together, feel your immense capacity that is bigger than our personal capacity, capacity of awake awareness that's right here in the center of this moment. The mind has gotten hooked into past or future. We're embellishing the present. Gently begin again. This breath.
all of these sensations, sounds, tastes, thoughts, moving through, arising and passing. Nothing to hold on to, nothing to push away. Each moment absolutely unique. And in these last few minutes of the practice, if you would like to transition to a metta practice, touching into and growing our aspirations, our intentions, cultivating the skillful wishes. May I be happy and free of dukkha, happy and peaceful. <coughs> May I be protected by love and wisdom. May I be well in body and mind. May I awaken and be free. May I live every day as if it's my first. And then inviting into awareness some being or group of beings that you care for. Maybe someone you know, could be a place, could be a group of people near or far. May you be peaceful. May you be protected by love 
and wisdom. May you be well. May you awaken and be free. May I, may you, may all beings everywhere awaken to the preciousness of each day and each moment and our capacity for love and wisdom. Thank you for joining us on this uh, YouTube uh, recording. Uh, if you if you practice with us there, we appreciate you being here. And uh, please check the links below. I'll put the link to the podcast. Um, you can also find uh, Sulika on on Instagram and and find that soundbite. Uh, and I'll also put a link for the, the ROM exhibit. And uh, I, I, um, I'll i also put a link, there's an upcoming retreat and the first weekend of April, um, a weekend retreat. It's Thursday night to a Monday noon, um, kind of a long, like a slightly extended weekend. So we get a full three days. Um, on the heavenly messengers or the messengers of awakening, aging, sickness, death, and um, renunciation. And uh, that is in Southern Ontario with myself and another teacher, Elizabeth Schramm. And uh, so I'll put the, the link for that if you're, if you're looking for a spring weekend retreat. It'd be lovely to have you there. Um, Thanks for joining us. I just want to thank you for the link last week. I don't know if it was via Micah, but for the daily Tijania. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right. Tijania, yes. It's so wonderful. I really like, I really enjoy the daily 